Hi, y'all. Let's talk a little bit about the media, Donald Trump, and some bombing in Syria and Afghanistan. So I'm sure everyone knows that the president launched a missile strike on Syria, and that a, a general in Afghanistan dropped a big old bomb on, on some ISIS people. Now, of course, this uh, made the media realize that we still have troops in Afghanistan, so they're like, oh, we've got to write some articles and come up with some catchy headlines. Uh, what can we say? Oh, I know. We can cobble this together with a little bit of that and a little bit of this, and then we can, we can write an article about how the president has flip-flopped. Uh, he said during the campaign that he didn't want to be the world's policeman, a talking point for a presidential candidate since forever and a day ago. Uh, but he also said that he would be bombing the shit out of ISIS. So when the mother of all bombs was dropped in Afghanistan on ISIS fighters, that should not give rise to the media's trying to say that this is in conflict with his campaign strategy. This was an explicit part of his campaign. We're going to try, we're, we're going to kill ISIS, we're going to bomb the shit out of them, and uh, he is doing that. Now, they were also tying that together with the Syria thing and saying that Syria and Afghanistan, you know, these are two things. We're being the world's policeman. First of all, he inherited the Afghanistan thing. We've had troops there since forever and a day ago. He's just got to deal with it. The general there is doing precisely what the general there should be doing. Uh, and the president, in respect of that, is doing what the president should do, which is not trying to run PR-type uh, military operations. When he says, I've given, you know, the, my, the military has full authorization or total authorization, that is the, that's what a president should do with respect to his commanding generals. If you don't trust the judgment of a general that you have, you should get rid of the general, not try to run the war for them. And when you send people in, this is one of the things I hated about George Bush, when you send people in to a, a combat zone, uh, you know, put the leadership in place like I mentioned. The leadership should be competent and they should know what it is they're there to do. But as the political leader, when you put them in, you say, General, go there and win. You know, fight well, be honorable, that kind of stuff. But go there and win. But the Bush administration didn't do that. Um, if you look at like the Battle of Fallujah, where our troops were ordered not to return fire if there might be civilian casualties. So American troops were running, building to building, dodging bullets when they couldn't shoot back because of some order that came down from the Bush administration. That is about as close to treason, in my view, as a president can get without actually just joining sides with the other side, you know, just joining forces with the other side. It, is a, it was a failure on Bush's part and many other uh, political people a failure on their part to appreciate what war entails. If you cannot deal with civilian, uh, civilian casualties and the destruction of civilian infrastructure that's going to hurt civilian populations, you are too stupid and have no business being in power anywhere. Uh, and you should never, ever let the bad outcomes of war that are inadvertent uh, distract from the mission. So you should not let bad PR be a reason to say, oh, well, we're going to suddenly start fighting you know, a non-war. It's just complete nonsense. <clears throat> so with Trump saying this to his generals, <clears throat> you have such authority as you require to win. You know, our, our troops, when they go in, they always try to avoid civ civilian casualties. They always try to avoid this wanton destruction of stuff that doesn't need to be destroyed, in particular uh, religious landmarks, uh, any place people would, would go to for safety. So we don't bomb hospitals, we don't bomb churches, we don't bomb mosques, we don't bomb synagogues. Uh, thing, places like that. And when our enemies occupy these places and start shooting at our troops, um, we try to find a way to get rid of them without destroying that sanctuary, even though they're, they're contaminating that area by their presence and you know fighting a dirty war. We still try not to do this. And that's been our policy for about a century, at least. If you go look back at uh, how we fought in World War uh, II, for example, and you go look at Monte Cassino, and how before uh, the Allied forces starting, started to bomb Monte Cassino, they sent warning to the, the priests, please flee, we're going to blow these Nazis uh, away, we're terribly sorry about your monastery, we've tried not to touch it, but since they're there, and they're using it to conduct operations against us, it's got to go. But here's a warning, uh, you have time to get to safety if you possibly can. So we try to, to warn the civilian populations, not to be in certain places, if we have to destroy something that is otherwise a sanctuary. Um, the generals know how to fight a war, they know how to fight a just war, and they know how to try to avoid civil civilian casualties. Nevertheless, there will just be civilian casualties. You can't 
you, you can't fight a war and avoid this. And when you let the PR dictate the strategy, you might as well just pull out. You have no business being there. So that's the good thing that he's doing in respect of that. He's letting the generals do their job. That's why we send them to like war college to you know, learn how to fight wars. And uh, you pick good people to do it, and then you, you know, make sure they get all the stuff they need, and you know, go forth and, and do your job, General. But on the Syria thing, on the world policemen, how this might be in contest with the world, we don't want to be the world's policemen, but here we are intervening in this kind of thing. Uh, if you think about what a cop does day to day, they go from call to call to call to call to call to call. It doesn't matter what it is, they just go. When they get a call, they go to it. That's not what Trump is doing. He is just living up to a position that we have held for a long time, even though not so much under Barack Obama, and only partially under Bill Clinton, that there are certain kinds of things that we simply won't tolerate. Uh, you know, tyrants of the world, be on notice. When you are thinking about committing genocide, uh, we want you to think of American troops, American Marines. We want you to think of American artillery, American weaponry. Uh, and let that, let that resonate in your mind before you decide to give an order to start committing genocide or ethnic cleansing. So, too, with the deployment of uh, weapons of mass destruction. So, you know, <clears throat> I want a president who is in office to do that if someone is using uh, we weapons of mass destruction, if someone is committing genocide, to say, you know, look, there are bad things that happen in the world. We can't be everywhere. We can't be all things to all people all the time. Uh, we can't go and in getting involved to try to stop all the bad stuff that happens here or every war there, the civil war there. But there are certain occasions, with certain events, that history has shown that if you don't intervene early, it's going to cost you a whole lot in the long run, and you simply can't ignore it. The Nazis taught us a great deal, and it is folly to forget their lessons. Whenever you see genocide starting, you need to, you need to get on top of that right away and just start slaughtering the side that's committing the genocide. Um, and if and the consequence of that is that it gets you sucked into a war, so be it. Because the history of the world has shown that when you let tyrants run roughshod, over whoever they would like. They, they eventually get you know, more and more and more powerful, and you have to fight them when they're stronger rather than when they're weaker. It's much better to get them early on. Uh, so too with the deployment of um, weapons of mass destruction. If you remember back at the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, granted this was nuclear weaponry, so the, the calculus is a little bit different here with nuclear arms on one, uh, one hand and chemical weapons on the other, but the point is still uh, a good one when uh, you talk about uh, Kennedy's policy, it will be the policy of the United States to treat any deployment, any use of a nuclear weapon against anyone in this hemisphere as an attack on us, and we will respond accordingly. I think that should be the policy with respect to uh, the deployment of any weapon of mass destruction. This isn't like dropping a bomb that goes, you know, you shoot a missile here, you want it to go to, you know, X marks the spot, and it misses and hits a school. That is absolutely terrible. Wish it would never, ever happen. But that is an accident. That is, an, that is not the intended outcome. That's the one-off. Yes, it sucks. People have been killed. Uh, it is absolutely terrible. That is not what it is when you use a weapon of mass destruction. That is wanton killing just for its own sake. There's no strategic advantage to be gained in using weapons of mass destruction. Chemical weapons, if the First World War taught us anything, only inflict misery. They don't stop wars. They don't win wars. All they do is torture people and show the depths to which some people are willing to go in order to be cruel to their fellow humans. Uh, and it, so th those uses are cruelty for cruelty's sake. It is the, it, it is, it's perverse in the Edgar Allan Poe sense. A person who is inflicting the maximum amount of punishment, of pain, torture, that they can on other people simply because they know they're not supposed to. Uh, so <clears throat> there's that. So when, when you start seeing that this is arising, that someone has, one, procured weapons of mass destruction, which is an interesting thing that you might not want to know about, uh, putting that aside, you know, the simple fact that they have it, but then two, using it, you need to intervene. And I talked about in the lead up to the election that Clinton was reckless in her rhetoric with uh, Russia talking about how she would impose this no-fly zone. Uh, and my objection there is, one, you'd have to vi violate the sovereignty of another nation. Um, and then start getting our aircraft in hostile engagements with Russian aircraft to enforce the no-fly zone, which you'll say it would be a mutual no-fly zone. There's no such thing as a mutual no-fly zone. No-fly zones are always imposed against the consent 
of the people who have to live with it. That's what it means. We're telling you, you will not fly here or we will start killing you. So you can, you can try to fly here if you want to, but you will die. And so you'll have our airplanes there policing a no-fly zone that Syria doesn't want and uh, has given Russia permission to fly in their airspace. So that puts us directly in, in uh, conflict with Russian aircraft. And that is setting the stage for the lowest ranking pilot in either military to be the arbiter of when war does, does, and, does and doesn't start. You don't want a lieutenant deciding now's, the good, now's a good time for the next big war of the world. If such a decision has to be made, it should be made by the commander-in-chief and the senior leadership. You know, the people who ordered the missile strike. The ones at the top of the food chain, not the ones at the bottom of the, of the food chain. This is a new engagement. It's dissimilar from Afghanistan, where we already have forces deployed. This is a, a new engagement, and you don't want the lowest ranking person that you have on the scene to be able to decide that now we're going to be in it uh, full, you know, we're going to be uh, balls deep in it. That really should be the senior leadership, which is precisely what happened. And that it should be the case. And there's no, it should be the case that when weapons of mass destruction are used or genocide starts, that the United States intervenes. And why should it be that? Because we seem to be the only people on the planet who actually have the, the will and the capacity to intervene early rather than just say, oh, well, you know, it's just their culture. That's just how they, those brown people there, they just can't control themselves. You know, and then you get all the calamities you have happening in Europe right now. You really got to get on top of this stuff early. If, if Obama had done it, as opposed to his saying, oh, I'm going to draw a red line, <laughs> and then do absolutely nothing, uh, then maybe you wouldn't have had this last attack. But Trump has done the right thing. Use weapons of mass destruction one more time, you know, Mr. Tyrant, and see what's coming to you. And to the Russians, um, who you know, have said to don't, do, don't attack Syria again, make sure they don't use uh, weapons of mass destruction, and you will get your way. But if it comes to war with Russia, in order to stop people from using weapons of mass destruction, then I guess we're just going to have to have a little conflict with Russia. The distinction is where the decision is being made and why it's being made. I don't want military uh, conflict with Russia. I really don't. I don't want wars anywhere. But there's a difference between just the normal vicissitudes of war and then the, the extra bits that have shown that if you leave these unchecked, they, they do redound negative, negatively for you in the long run, and you're going to lose a lot of blood and treasure uh, if you don't do something about it early. Clinton just wants to do it for the sake of doing it. This is in response to uh, actions that have been taken. Now, of course, this, I'm going to ramble here a little bit now so you can stop watching. Now, of course, uh, you've got the conspiracy theorists. People are like, oh, it's a false flag. Uh, that intelligence is dodgy, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, those kinds of folks. And then you can, like, watch them... Um, <clears throat> or not watch them, I suppose, listen to them, or read their arguments, watch their videos uh, on various killings that happen, and they always give you their informed expert analysis on the subject, which means whatever they learned on NCIS the week before is the extent of what they know to look for. And uh, so you'll see, like, in the Syrian gas attack, you'll see, like, uh, oh, well, this couldn't have happened uh, when they said it happened because, it was, look, this person's there with no gloves, this person's, you know, that person doesn't have on a mask, and they're doing okay. Like it's sarin gas. It's a non-persistent agent. It has about the same vapor pressure as, uh, as water, which means that it evaporates about as quickly as water does. So about 45 minutes in the desert, and it's gone. Uh, assuming that you just had it, it sprayed on things, but that's not how uh, air deployments of, uh, of these weapons happen, because you have to turn it into an, aer an aerosol. It's not like... Um, you know, taking, uh, I don't know, what is it, you put some, like, chemical in some water and go spray the weeds. It's not like that. And it isn't like uh, a fog of, of um, evaporate. You've got to make it turn into an aerosol and disperse it. And because it's not, because it's a non-persistent agent, it doesn't last long. So, you know, the people show up half an hour later or whatever it is. Yeah, they're at some risk because some of it is still lurking around. But they aren't at a very large risk for uh, the kind of exposure they're going to get in this kind of environment. You know, it's an open place, it's the desert, it's evaporating quickly, there's a breeze, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, you'll notice that, like, some people are stiff and other people aren't stiff. And uh, so, you know, they're, oh, it's a uh, rigor mortis has already set in. It's, the, the timeline is wrong. You know, you look around, it's like, okay, these people don't know the difference between rigor mortis and a cadaveric, uh, cadaveric spasm. Um, you know, as I'm looking, because I'm looking through the same pictures they are, uh, and I'm really looking at them. When I look through that, what I'm looking for are 
uh, what are the conditions of the body, you know, uh, rigor and liver. I'm trying to see if I can spot any of that. Uh, if you see some people who appear to be stiff and some people who aren't, you know, is this just a, this person's an all early onset of rigor? Uh, has that person been dead much longer? They're already out of rigor. And you're trying to look for clues uh, to try to, to hone in on this timeline. And so, you know, look, uh, you'll find some pictures where the person is dead and their eyes are open. So you look and you say, oh, I don't see any uh, attached noir de la sclerotique, as it's called in the literature, uh, which is what happens to eyes when they remain open after a person dies. It happens a little bit before rigor sets in. Uh, now, in looking at that and, and noticing what I'm not seeing in the pictures, it could be the case that the resolution of the picture isn't, isn't sufficient to capture the development of, of the tac noir that's already happened. That's, that could be one thing that would explain it. Or, it's just that it hasn't started developing yet, because it hasn't been that period of time. Uh, and so what you're seeing there is not rigor mortis. What you're seeing there is, in fact, a, uh, a cadaveric spasm, which, though somewhat rare uh, in deaths generally, aren't all that rare in traumatic deaths. Uh, suicides, uh, somewhat common in suicides, and gas attacks, uh, people are, con are convulsing when they're dying. Uh, their muscles just freeze like that sometimes. And uh, so when I'm looking through the pictures, I don't see any development of the uh, attached noir. I see that kind of thing, so the timeline fits. You know, anyway, I, I, you shouldn't pay too much attention to the conspiracy theorists, but you don't want to ignore them completely because occasionally even they say true things that you might want to think about. But anyway, you know, as I, as I said, the extent of their information is whatever they saw in last week's NCIS. That's what they know about forensics. That's what they know about uh, being an investigator and how to exploit imagery and documents that you might read. Anyway, whatever. So that's what I'm looking at. And I'm like, oh, okay, the timeline's plausible. I see this, I don't see that, I see the other. Uh, and then I've got this other information on the other end is saying that there's been an intercept of officials of the Syrian regime talking with other people about this before it had happened. Uh, now, of course, that could be made up. I don't know how reliable it is because the uh, intelligence services as you might be surprised to learn, don't call me to let me know about all this. So, who knows? I certainly hope that President Trump, uh, when looking at this, is thinking along the lines that I'm thinking of, or more particularly that he has intelligence analysts who are thinking along the lines, more along the lines of what I'm thinking of, and who are presenting him with this information in such a way that he can make an intelligent decision, as opposed to just, oh, yeah, let's go, you know, let's bomb something, it'll be... Oh, you know, someone's been gas attacked. Sad. Let's bomb something. The greatest bomb. It'll be the best. It'll be an excellent bomb. A wonderful bomb. We'll get so tired of bombing. We're like, oh, I can't take any more. Stop bombing. Or whatever it is he says. Anyway, uh, so that's what I have to say about the, the first part of that's what I have to say about the relationship of the media to the story and the correctness of the president's actions. And then the latter part's just my ruminating on various things I've seen around the internet in, in the intervening time. And with that, I bid you good day. Bye-bye.